cutting or maybe unsophisticated investors in a deal. Well, the reality is it's not really going to be 500 investors. It's not going to be 1,000 investors. It's most likely going to be 30, 40, 50 investors that are in a deal. Many of these deals, the average deal is $117,000. Um, and so the amount of people that are back in them are going to be smaller. You're going to see portals that pop up and have minimal requirements for investors to come in in the future. So that'll reduce the number of investors that are coming in. But what we found in this question, and then we asked another question to, uh, in, in what we were asked this question is, how many of you went out looking for angel or VC financing before you went to the crowd? And the majority of them did. And the majority of them got to know. Because the majority of us that walk into the door of an angel or a VC get a few nice, not interested, doesn't get my sweet spot, um, and they pass it. So this forces people, this forces these 87 companies to actually turn to the crowd. Um, once they were successful with their campaigns, it was fascinating. They were saying, the minute our campaign was funded, we started to get calls. The minute. Because what it shows is, wow, there are people engaged in this company that are willing to put skin in the game, take the risk for these angels or VCs. And that alone will allow de-risks the investment for angels or VCs. So we saw that 71% of those companies had either closed or were in talks to take on follow-up money. I think that's a, that represents tremendous potential for crowdfunding globally because what it does, it allows the crowd to step in in this funding void that exists out there for startups and small businesses to take on that risk, which is a shared risk with the entrepreneur and the investors and the community, and to go out there and prove something so that follow-on investors will come in and say, not all companies, not all investment ideas will be a good investment for them, but some of them will be the ones that they want to invest in. So, if we're going to build a, an effective crowdfund capital strategy, we need to have four needs. And these are keys that need to be in place, okay? And they're sort of pulling on each other, if you look at it. Uh, you need to have protection for investors. You need to have capital for businesses. You need to have enablement uh, for the platforms. You need to have new platforms and the whole ecosystem around it. And you have to have transparency for regulators. Because if we can't build these markets in a very efficient and transparent manner in which people can see what's happening, they won't trust what's going on. Now, I really do believe that we will be able to uh, build these very transparent marketplaces because, and you might have heard this before, but it's, it's again, another one of my favorite things about crowdfunding. The private capital markets in the United States are a $1.1 trillion private capital market for which the SEC has barely any idea about what's going on. Because it happens in boardroom behind closed doors, and that information is not shared with them. Crowdfunding takes place online. All of the data related to crowdfunding will be happening online. It will be fed into databases online. And it's not just data that will let regulators see what's going on and who's getting funded, but it's data that Bloomberg will be used shortly to see what are the trends going on globally with crowdfunding? Where are the jobs being created in crowdfunding? How much capital is going into different sectors with crowdfunding? That's the data that will be the most powerful output of this. And it is the transparency that I believe will be brought to the whole crowdfunding ecosystem, not just for the regulators, but for the investors at large. We will be able to see the valuation of a dry cleaner in Minneapolis very soon, and that valuation, once it is set, once the crowd comes in and, and invests at a certain price, will become the standard for other valuations, not only in Florida where I live, but in other parts of the world too. We will be able to see trends that are going on with these valuations and what people believe is a fair price for companies. That's transparency brought to the private capital markets that hasn't existed until today, but will be the future. Pretty lofty ideas. Pretty lofty goals. How can we accomplish this on a global scale? People look at us and they say, how do you think you're gonna get this done? Who are you to think that you can change things and institutions that have been in place for 80 years? And I don't think we necessarily alone are the answer. I know we're not. Uh, we are part of something much bigger than ourselves and we are just a uh, mechanism now to 
to speak about it, but I like to tell people all the time when we're out there talking about this global opportunity that when we showed up in Washington, D.C. and did not know a thing about Washington, D.C. when we showed up, there were 10,200 bills introduced into Congress the year that we showed up. 10,200 trying to become a law. There were about 220 passed into law by Congress, because you know our Congress is polarized. They don't like to get things done these days. Okay? There were seven pieces of legislation that were significant measures. The Jobs Act was one of them, and crowdfunding of Title III was one of them. When you've got an idea that can ignite a global solution, you can make a true impact, and that's what this is. Now we need to figure out how to do this, not just in the United States, not just in Canada or Europe. We need to figure out how we can take everything that I was just talking about and connect it in a global ecosystem. So our big idea, and the one that we're very focused on now, that we have the interest of the World Bank and other multilateral organizations that are saying, we think this sounds pretty good. Let's try and figure out how we can address this. These people think about this. Billions and billions of dollars are spent every year on entrepreneurship and innovation and startups. Okay? It's not that the money's not there. It's how we allocate the money better to help enable this crowdfunding ecosystem. So our new goal is to build a fund uh, to raise a five hundred million dollar fund to enable a crowdfunding ecosystem globally to take all those pieces that I was talking about and pull them together to build them if they don't exist, to enable them if they don't flourish in the way they need to flourish. We believe that we need to allocate this money to investor protection, to make sure that we've got the protections in place so an investor's money isn't lost, that there's oversight bodies. There needs to be a global crowdfunding body that oversees regulations globally, that can come up with model rules that we can use so that countries and governments can feel confident working together and allowing investors to send money across their borders, okay? That requires an integrated global regulatory body. We need to now allow for the ecosystem development. If the portals aren't there in uh, Nigeria, we need to help foster that. If we've got platforms that are expanding globally, we need to enable them to expand globally. We need to help the ecosystem players that need the platforms itself to survive, to flourish. So the startup weekends, the incubators, the accelerators, the oversight people in these countries, we need them there. We need to help them survive, sustain themselves. We need to fund their development. But the other thing that I think we need to do is to, to take half of that and do a co-investment fund and say to the world, to entrepreneurs globally, if you have an idea, and crowdfunding. Go out to the crowd and see if you can raise 100% of your funding target. If you can hit 70% of your funding target, this fund, which will be funded by multilateral organizations and development banks globally, so we're just going to allocate a fraction, a small fraction of all the money that they have, that they cannot deploy, by the way, into startups and small businesses because they don't have the ability to scale down to that level. But with this type of fund, that is a co-investment fund, we can say if you hit 70% of your funding target, we will come in with the last 30%. The fund knows that they've got a group of engaged people behind them. The fund knows that those people put skin in the game. The fund knows that all we need to do is cap it off. And that allows them to fulfill their goals of deploying capital into the SME market. Again, huge vision. That's what South, what South Coast is all about. So, in summary, no look at other questions. Businesses create jobs. Jobs can create economic and political stability. This is the work that we are doing in the Middle East. I love it. I think it is completely fascinating to be engaged in a region of the world that is in complete turmoil. I was driving through Tahir Square last week, hours before the latest protest and demonstration. I just wanted to get out and say, crowdfunding is the solution. <laughs> but I know better than that. I put myself in line and my mother would tell us. So, but I believe it represents 
an answer for these people that don't know it exists today. They just want, like I said in that slide, the opportunity to get a job. They want to feel validated as an individual. They want the rights to education and safety. Um, crowdfunding may be that solution for them. It is much more than financing. It is much more than portals alone. It is an entire ecosystem that is connected. And it will take this lofty vision of putting a fund together or some type of multilateral fund like this that gives us the ability to pull the players and the stakeholders together to build an overall regulated body so that we can enable crowdfunding 